everybody, welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers Podcast. Through the arts, the Harlem Renaissance, the blossoming of African American culture of the 1920s and early 1930s, brought to light the previously overlooked African American experience, redefining how others saw African Americans and how they saw themselves. Harlem Renaissance today, you guys, the second last installment of Black History Month episodes of uh, from Insightful Thinkers Podcast. Um, we're kind of progressing chronologically. We started with the transatlantic slave trade. We moved on to the Underground Railroad, which was happening during slavery. Now we're talking about the Harlem Renaissance. This is after slavery. We're going to talk all about it today and have an in-depth analysis into this. What is the Harlem Renaissance? Well, it is it is kind of, as I mentioned, this this flourishing of African-American culture that was happening in, in the Harlem region of Manhattan, New York City in the 1920s and early 1930s. What really united participants of the Renaissance was their sense of taking part in a common endeavor and their commitment to giving artistic expression to the African-American experience during this time. They were, they started to bring to light the, um, what it meant to be black in America in this time through art, through poetry and through literature. It encompassed um, poetry, prose, painting, sculpture, jazz, swing, opera, dance, all sorts of arts. And what united these diverse art forms was, again, their real, their very realistic impression of what it meant to be black in America. It was what the writer, the legendary writer Langston Hughes called an expression of our individual dark skinned selves, um, as well as a new militancy in asserting our civil and political rights. So this is what um, the Harlem Renaissance was all about. During this time, there was an increase in output by African American writers, including Langston Hughes, um, increased output from visual artists and from musicians all throughout New York City. And this sparked the interest um, in black culture, not just among African Americans, but also among uh, whites as well. And upper middle class whites uh, in, in New York City, they would come uptown to Harlem to experience the black life. So there was a growing interest in these black visual arts that were proliferating during this time. While at its core, it was primarily a literary movement. It was, in fact, the most influential uh, movement in African-American literary history. The Harlem Renaissance touched all of the African-American creative arts. While participants were determined to truthfully represent the African-American experience and believed in racial pride and equality, they really shared no common political philosophy or uh ideology within the Harlem Renaissance. It was more of an identity than an ideology. It was, it was letting your black identity flourish in your art rather than some kind of, rather than it being based on an overarching, uh, style or political ideology. It was just about bringing the African American experience to the forefront through art. Um, it was, it was, a movement of individuals who were free of any overriding manifesto. So some of these overriding manifestos sometimes exist in the arts. You see, I believe Andre Breton made the surrealist manifesto and that kind of was what all the surrealist artists followed. And, but the Harlem Renaissance had nothing of this sort. It was just the African experiment experience coming to light in, in the arts. Um, it was the first time that a considerable number of mainstream publishers and critics took African-American literature seriously, really. And it was the first time that African-American literature and the arts attracted significant attention from the nation at large. It wasn't just within Harlem. We'll talk about the location and why is it called the Harlem Renaissance, because it was happening really all across the United States and across the world to a certain extent. Even in Paris, there were artists and um but it was the first time that African-American literature and arts really started to capture the nation at large. Music was also a prominent feature of African-American culture during the Harlem Renaissance. The term jazz age was used by many who saw African-American music, especially the blues and jazz, as the defining features of the Renaissance. However, both jazz and the blues were actually imports to Harlem. Um, 
they emerged out of the African-American experience around the turn of the century in southern towns and cities, actually. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't the Harlem Renaissance that initiated jazz and um, in New York. Jazz really started in New Orleans and Memphis and St. Louis and the southern regions. And we talk about that in the origins of jazz music. Uh, go ahead and listen to that one for more uh, analysis into that specifically. I think it was released sometime close to episode 20. So that's talking about how jazz, it didn't, I, I thought it did start in, in New York or initially, um, but it actually did start in Louisiana in these Southern areas. And it was like a, a, with the Creole culture and with the mix of a European classical music with African music. And it, it started to, uh, there was a lot of cultural diversity in that area in the time. And that's where jazz really started, but it actually came up to Harlem and, and it proliferated from then on out. The themes specific to the, Harlem Renaissance, as we kind of talked about, no black writer, musician, or, or artist expressed all of the themes of the Harlem Renaissance in, in one of, in each of their works, but every artist addressed one or more of these themes in their work in some way. They, they touched on some of these themes of, of what it meant to be black in America. So one of the first themes was uh, an effort to recapture the African American past its rural southern roots, urban experience, and African heritage were, were all tried to be captured by some of these artists. Interest in the African past corresponded with the rise of Pan-Africanism in African American politics, which was at the center of Marcus Garvey's ideology and also a concern of W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 1920s. Pan-Africanism we actually just touched on this in the transatlantic slave trade. It's the union and the uh, the idea of creating more of a union and a bond between those of African descent. And all of the African Americans can join up. And um, Marcus Garvey, he wanted them to go, he had the back to Africa movement and not only join up and have union among your brothers and sisters, but also go back to Africa too. So this is this... Uh, this Pan-African theme was present in a lot of the works at the time and, and examining your, your roots, your Southern roots and your urban experience and also all the way back to your African heritage. This was present in the arts during the Harlem Renaissance. Another theme was there was a general fascination with ancient African history during this time. This followed the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. So the early 1920s when it was starting. Poets County Cullen and Langston Hughes addressed their African heritage in their roots, while artist Aaron Douglas used African motifs in his art. A number of musicians, from the classical composer William Grant Still to jazz great Louis Armstrong, introduced African-inspired rhythms uh, and themes in their compositions. Again, going back to the origins of jazz music uh, that we talked about, the, the, the rhythm, the soulful vocals, and the improvisation, and the use of drums, guitars, horns, banjos, uh, all derive from West African traditions. Uh, so we, we talked about how, in that episode, again, sorry to refer back to it so much, but how we talked about how jazz, in a way, combined the elements of African and European music. And this is what was happening also in the Harlem Renaissance. While they were kind of going back to their African roots, they were letting this come out in their art. And there was a fascination with African history in, in their writings and in, in their music. You could see how the African influence was intertwined inside of it. There was also an exploration of Black Southern heritage. So since uh, Africans were transported to the United States as slaves and how they there was slavery in, uh, going on in the South. This exploration of Black Southern heritage was reflected in novels by Jean Toomer and Zora Neale, as well as Jacob Lawrence uh, and his art. Zora Neale Hudson, or Hurston specifically, used her experience as a folklorist as the basis for her extensive study of rural Southern black life. In her 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Jacob Lawrence also, in terms of his art, he turned to African American history uh, in many of his paintings, including his Harriet Tubman series and the one on the black migration. Um, We'll talk about the black migration later in the episode and how that actually contributed to the beginnings of the Harlem Renaissance. But you can see how there's more of an exploration of African-American heritage, really, and, and slavery in the South. And, and that was present in a lot of the writings and also in the art of the time. 
There was also an exploration of life in Harlem and other urban centers. Um, Many poets drew on Harlem imagery for their poetry, and Claude McKay used the ghetto as the setting for his first novel, Home to Harlem. Another theme was race. Virtually every novel in play, and most of the poetry during the Harlem Renaissance, explored race in America, especially the impact of how race... uh, uh, the impact of racism, excuse me, on, of, on African Americans. In their simplest form, these works protested racial injustice. Claude McKay's sonnet, If We Must Die, was among the best of his genre. Langston Hughes, again, also wrote protest pieces, as did almost every black writer at one time or another during the Harlem Renaissance. So we have this increased consideration for what it means to be black and what it meant to be black in America and what it still means in the urban cities. This is what was proliferating during the Harlem Renaissance. We talked all about Harlem Renaissance, Harlem this, Harlem that. Why was it even called the Harlem Renaissance though? Was all of this happening in Harlem? Well, no, not really. But Harlem's location in the communications capital of North America helped give African Americans the visibility and the opportunities for publication that weren't, didn't really exist elsewhere. So just being in New York City, being in the hub, allowed Harlem, um, a largely black neighborhood, to uh, just have a great population of African Americans who could, who could produce these things. And then it was also in an area where there was there were uh, publication companies and there was the visibility in, in big New York City, not so big as it is now, but even back then it still was the hub. Um, Harlem and New York City also contained the infrastructure to support and sustain the arts. In the early 20th century, New York had already replaced Boston as the center of the book pub- publishing industry. Furthermore, new publishing houses in the city were open to adding greater diversity to their book lists by also including works by African American writers. So they were starting to branch out, look for more, uh, more authors, not just the white authors, but also the black authors too. By the late 19th century, New York City housed Tin Pan Alley, the center of the music publishing industry. In the 1920s, when recordings and broadcasting emerged, New York was again in the forefront. Broadway was the epicenter of American theater, and New York was the center of American art in the world. In short, the early 20th century uh, was a time when no other American city possessed the businesses and institutions to support literature um, in the way that New York did. So it was really the hub. and. Black intellectuals from all over, from Washington, from Baltimore, from Philly, from L.A. and other cities, even though they had their own intellectual circles there and reading groups there, they actually also met in Harlem or settled there uh, to have discussions and debates and to create and do these things. And Harlem was really the hub for a lot of these things. By 1920, Harlem itself, by virtue of of the sheer size of its black population, had emerged as basically the black capital of America. Its name, uh, just Harlem, that name really evoked a magic um, that lured all classes of blacks from all across the country to its streets. It, It housed the National Urban League and the black leadership of the NAACP that I'm sure you all are familiar with Harlem's nightclubs, music halls, and jazz joints became the center of New York nightlife in the mid-1920s. Harlem was really where all the action was in black America during the decade after World War I. So 1920s, 1930s, Harlem was really where it was at. So certainly Harlem was central to the Harlem Renaissance, but in reality, it does serve more as, as an anchor for the movement rather than its sole location. Only a handful of the writers, artists, musicians, and other figures of the Harlem Renaissance were native to Harlem or New York, and only a few uh, actually lived in Harlem throughout the Renaissance period. So while the Harlem Renaissance was not really confined to Harlem, uh, in New York City, it, it did attract a remarkable concentration of intellect and talent and served as the symbolic capital of the cultural awakening of black America. So this is why it's called the Harlem Renaissance. How did it? So we've talked about what is the Harlem Renaissance? Why is it called the Harlem Renaissance? But how did 
How did it become the capital of Black America for all of these arts to take place? Well, it's be all this was happening in Harlem because of the Great Migration. The Great Migration was the widespread migration of African Americans in the 20th century from rural communities in the South to large cities in the North and in the West during and immediately following World War I. At the turn of the 20th century, the vast majority of Black Americans actually lived in the Southern states. But from 1916 to 1970, so 1916, that's around the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, during the Great Migration, about 6 million black Southerners relocated to urban areas in the North and in the West. Harlem was one of these places that all of these black people were going to and relocating. You might ask now, why were they relocating in the first place? Why, why weren't they happy in the South? What was going on there? Well... Let, okay, let's start with things that pushed black people out of the South and to the North. Blacks left the South in record numbers really to escape oppression. Um, and you can even see it today. The South is a little more racist than the North. And this has existed really since for almost all of U.S. history when you really look back. And that, uh, that racist culture really has just not simply disappeared in the South. Um, there were really poor economic conditions for black people in the South. These were exacerbated by the limitations of sharecropping, farm failures, and crop damage from the boll weevil blight of 1890. Boll weevils are pests that infested and ruined many Southern farmers' crops in the 1890s. So this is part of the reason their crops were all dying out. Um, uh, there were farm failures and there was also the limitations of sharecropping. Sharecropping is a system where the landlord or planter allows a tenant to use the land in exchange for a share of the crop. So usually the landlord was a white man. This is after slavery, by the way, but this is basically the new slavery <clears throat> that was generated to still suppress black people even after uh, emancipation. So the landlord would have a tenant, usually the black man, and he could use the land and he could, he would basically plow, do all the work. And the landlord would just get a share of the crops at the end of the day. But high interest rates and unpredictable harvests also with unscrupulous landlords and merchants often kept tenant farmers severely indebted. Many blacks who toiled and toiled as sharecroppers actually ended up being trapped in an endless cycle of debt as sharecroppers. Laws favoring landowners, so, so the white people typically, about two thirds of the landowners were white. These laws made it difficult or even illegal for the black sharecroppers to sell their crops to anyone else besides their own landlord, or they prevented sharecroppers from moving if they were indebted to a landlord. So they were really, they felt as if they had no freedom and they were really still owned by the landowner, by the white person. So it was really just slavery by another name even after emancipation. Uh, so many African Americans sought to escape this, and this is why they moved north. They also wanted to escape the ongoing racial oppression in the form of the Jim Crow laws. We talked about the Jim Crow laws in uh, Systemic Racism in the United States. That episode was released sometime in the teens, if you want to check that out. So the Jim Crow laws were basically statutes after slavery that legalized segregation. So uh, marginalized African Americans, um, this, this is really what happened. African Americans were marginalized because they were denied the right to vote, hold jobs, uh, and get an education or access many other opportunities. Um, it was really the slavery after slavery. So uh, these are the types of factors that drove black people out of the South. Now let's talk about the factors that brought black people to the North. What was enticing about coming to the North and to the West in the first place? So they were really trying to take advantage of the urban economic opportunities uh, of the North. So 
There were encouraging reports of good wages and living conditions that spread by word of mouth and appeared in African American newspapers at this time, with advertisements for housing and employment in automobile manufacturing, steel and meat packing, and first-hand stories of newfound success in the North. The Chicago Defender, for example, became one of the leading promoters of the Great Migration. Uh, the Chicago Defender, I believe, was... Uh, a newspaper. So black people were reading these newspapers and they were saying, oh, there's all these jobs up north. We got to we got to go up here. There were promises of these, these open jobs for people to come. Um, cities that absorbed large numbers of migrants included Chicago, L.A., Detroit, Philly, Cleveland, and of course, New York City and Harlem. Um, or, or where Harlem was housed. So the Harlem section of Manhattan, which covers only three square miles, drew nearly 175,000 African Americans, giving the neighborhood the largest concentration of black people in the world. This is what allowed so many African Americans to reach Harlem and to allow it to even, or give it the potential to become a hub for African American culture in the first place. The migration of African Americans, uh, to the north changed the image of the African-American from, uh, in people's minds, from more of a rural and uneducated uh, peasant to one of urban cosmopolitan sophistication now. This new identity led to greater social consciousness and African-Americans became players on the world stage, expanding intellectual and social contracts internationally. So no longer could people, although people still did, uh, no longer could people really look down on black people as, as simply being uneducated or being um, nothing but uh, peasants or something. Now they became sophisticated. Now they were in the city. Now they were creating art. They were creating. They were writing. They were de they were doing all sorts of things in the arts. And this brought African American uh, urban life to the forefront, really. So these are the factors that led African Americans out of the South and up to the North. Um, but what, so, okay, so this is kind of the background, but what actually initiated the, the Renaissance now? So scholars debate both the start and end of the Renaissance. It's, it's really unclear. You can, you can't really put an exact, this was the day the Renaissance started because the arc of any cultural ethos is, is always going to be imprecise. You can't uh, put a specific mark on that. But the beginning, some say, could be marked with Claude McKay's 1919 poem, If We Must Die. This was a work that asserted a strong sense of self in the face of extreme opposition. McKay wrote the poem in response to the racial violence that occurred immediately after World War I and into the early 1920s, as blacks demanded recognition of and, and respect for their military service during World War I, many whites responded with murderous anger and forceful oppression, which sparked a series of race riots at the time. So Claude McKay's poem uh, asserted a, a sense of uh, self in the face of opposition, in the face of oppression, in the face of violence. Uh, this 1919 poem may have triggered a lot more of these uh, artists to talk about the black experience in America. On the other hand, the Civic Club dinner of March 21st, 1924 signaled the emergence of the Renaissance for some. This event did not occur in Harlem, but was held almost 100 blocks south in Manhattan at the Civic Club on 12th Street off of Fifth Avenue. So this, and in my opinion, this has, a, from what I found, had a little bit more uh, support for it to be known as the origin of the Harlem Renaissance. And, and you'll see why here. So this is how things kind of seem to snowball to start the Harlem Renaissance. Charles S. Johnson, the young editor of a monthly magazine called Opportunity, conceived this, this event, the Civic Club Dinner, to honor the African-American writer Jesse Fawcett on the publication of her new novel. So he initially just wanted to uh, honor, honor this writer, uh, uh, well, the legendary writer Jesse Fawcett on, on her new novel. So he planned a small dinner party of about 20 guests, uh, a mix of uh, white publishers, editors, and literary critics, as well as black intellectuals and young black writers. But when he asked Alain Locke to preside over the event, Locke agreed to preside over it 
only if the dinner honored African-American writers at large rather than just one novelist. So Johnson had to change the idea of the Civic Club dinner and not make it just honor Jesse Fawcett, but offer offer some kind of a uh, put a spotlight on all of the African-American writers at the time. So the simple celebratory dinner morphed into a transformative event with over a hundred attendees. African-Americans were represented by W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, and other uh, well-known black intellectuals, along with Fawcett and a representative group of poets and authors. White guests predominantly were publishers and critics. Carl Van Doren, the editor of Century Magazine, called upon the young writers in the audience to make their contribution to the new literary age that was emerging in America. So this thing kind of snowballed, and then we've got these major critics and major black intellectuals at the Civic Club dinner, uh, just in Manh- in the south of Manhattan, and everyone uh, now Carl Van Dorn is calling on all the the writers to uh, talk about their experience and, and add to the new literary age in America. So this seemed to bring some credence to the Harlem Renaissance. The Civic Club dinner significantly accelerated the at least the literary phase of the Harlem Renaissance. Friedrich Allen, the editor of Harper's approached County Cullen, securing his poems for his magazine as soon as the poet finished reading them. Uh, As the dinner ended, Paul Kellogg, the editor of Survey Graphic, hung around talking to Cullen, Fawcett, and several other young writers. He then offered Charles S. Johnson an entire issue of Survey Graphic devoted only to the Harlem literary movement. Under the editorship of Alain Locke, the Harlem, mecca of the New Negro publication of Survey Graphic hit the newsstands on March 1st, 1925. It was an overnight sensation. Later that year, Locke published a book-length version of the Harlem edition. In this book-length version, Locke laid down the vision of the aesthetic and the parameters for the emerging Harlem Renaissance. He also included a collection of poetry, fiction, graphic arts, and critical essays on art, literature, and music. So look at how things snowballed from this one dinner. All of a sudden, all these people get commissioned to go publish this, go publish that. You get a whole... uh, issue of this magazine to only talk about the the african-american art and put a spotlight on it and then this snowballed into an entire anthology where alan locke laid down his vision of what it meant to be part of this harlem renaissance and this literary movement that was emerging so this is how i personally think it, it snowballed a little more even more so than just the one uh the one publication before this, I think it was this Civic Club dinner that got people together and people started to uh, branch out from here. And the, the big hit of the issue of the magazine spawned into a, an entire uh, a volume, an anthology, putting a highlight on the African-American experience. Um, so a lot of recognition for the African-American art at this time did seem to come from the Civic Club dinner. Um, what what's the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance? What does it mean today? What did it mean at the time? And uh, what are the enduring effects? The Harlem Renaissance, it really challenged the pervading racism and stereotypes of the day and instead promoted progressive politics and racial and social integration. The widespread creation of art and literature served to uplift African-Americans in a sense. The movement laid the groundwork for all later African-American literature, really, and had an enormous impact on subsequent black literature and consciousness worldwide. It laid the groundwork, as we've we've talked about in, on this uh, podcast before, about how any creator, no matter how brilliant, always needs a stimulus, always needs an inspiration. The Harlem Renaissance, when you have all of these black creators doing these things, it inspires creators down the road and this is uh this is really where it started and and black literature started to come out and black art started to come out significantly in america inspiring so many more even if they don't know that they're inspired by the harlem renaissance the harlem renaissance might have inspired somebody in the 60s 70s and then that work inspired them today so it really initiated uh black art in america it it brought the black experience clearly uh, 
to the forefront uh, in American cultural history. It redefined how America and the world really viewed African Americans. It helped to establish the authority of black writers and artists in representing black culture and experience. And it created a continually expanding space for them within Western high art. Now black people had a place in high art or haute couture, as the French would say. They had a place here. They were not just sharecroppers and were certainly not slaves. We are artists and we can we can put these things forth and we can be among uh, the high art and haute couture. Uh, we have a place here is really what the Harlem renaissance started to establish it instilled in african americans across the country a new spirit of self-determination and pride and a new commitment to political activism and this even provided a foundation for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s because black people we have a voice and we can speak up and we can create our own art and uh we're, we're not second class citizens here we're among the best so this provided a foundation in a way even for the civil rights movement so look how art is now creating political change this is all mind-boggling stuff to you guys i'm sorry if i'm getting a little excited about it but uh it really is beautiful it, it, it brought notice uh the great it brought uh, to light the great works of african americans and inspired and influenced future generations of african american artists and intellectuals the self portrait of african american life identity and culture that emerged from harlem was transmitted to the world at large for the very first time this is the harlem renaissance this is a beautiful uh, sequence of events perhaps spiraling from uh <laughs> what was it called again the civic club dinner i believe um let me let me get this right for you guys uh civic club dinner yeah sp spiraling really from there 1920s 1930s black america was coming to the forefront in all sorts of arts um and, and this is what the harlem renaissance was you guys it was it was a beautiful occurrence that in inspires people even if they don't know it and inspired the person who inspired uh, you maybe thank you for listening to this episode everybody we are growing our community through word of mouth so if you like this episode share it with one or two people let them know about it just tell them about it and that's how we are continuing to grow you guys you can also do all the digital things rate like comment subscribe follow you guys have heard all these things a million times but they do all help with the discovery algorithms Whatever you do to support listening and watching is always plenty, you guys. I can't thank you guys enough for, <laughs> for tuning into the Insightful Thinkers podcast. We'll be back next Monday, as always, for more in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics. Take care, everybody.